Good morning, Scott Pringle with WSP. Um, I am the consultant project manager for the I-275 Bus Rapid Transit Project and Development and Environment Study. Rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> so one of the first things we did, uh, working very closely with, uh, uh, with David and t staff, as we went through the process of developing uh, a brand for this effort, uh, you will see that uh, presented in front of you. We are affectionately terming the, the study itself, Regional Rapid Transit. Um, I hope you find that that's a, it's a, a, a much easier uh, um, uh, description of what we're doing here. It's, uh, it's short, it's very succinct and to the point of what we're trying to accomplish in this particular project. So. I'm going to quickly walk you through an overview of where we are and where we're going, uh, give you a sense of the overall schedule for the regional rapid transit, talk to you a little bit about some of the outreach and coordination that we're undertaking, and then ultimately have a conversation and get some input about the goals moving the project forward. So just a quick uh, overview. Uh, when you think about taking a transit project, especially a premium transit project, and working it all the way from an idea on paper to actually being in operation and moving people, you have approximately about five different steps to get that accomplished. First being planning, then being fe excuse me, feasibility. Um, both of those have been completed for this particular project. The Regional Transit Feasibility Plan was brought forward to this board and approved in uh, November of last year. That puts us into steps three and four, which is looking at the preliminary engineering, doing some design, complying with the National Environmental Policy Act, and doing our, our environmental compliance work so that at the end of the day, we can go forward with a, a grant application to the Federal Transit Administration and hopefully get approval for funding that will work, that will give us the opportunity to go right to final design, construction, and operation. So uh, the team that you have working on this project for you uh, between WSP and AECOM is uh, the best in the country. Uh, between those two firms, we have done the greatest majority of uh, delivering BRT projects across the country. This map is just a quick sampling of some of those projects. So I'm really excited that we have this amazing team to bring to our disposal. Um, on our team, uh, we have, like I mentioned, AECOM, and I'm gonna introduce Don from AECOM in a couple of minutes. Um, we also have folks like InfraStrategy, uh, which are some of the best uh, funding and financing experts in the country. Um, and even here locally, we have Tyndale Oliver, who, as you know, is leading the Regional Transit Development Plan, providing a lot of cons uh, consistency between both the PD&E, or the Regional Rapid Transit, and the Regional Transit Development Plan. Our team and the experts that are on our team have uh, been leading the charge when it comes to freeway BRT, which is essentially what we're talking about here, uh, whether it's uh, between Denver and Boulder, Colorado, in Seattle, and even a project that's being started and initiated in Atlanta for the Georgia Express Lanes uh, State Route 400. So we're going to tackle the project based on these five primary milestones. Uh, our first milestone that we've been working on to date is taking a look at what came out of that feasibility study, that regional transit feasibility plan, addressing the concerns and comments that we got from public outreach through that process, developing some options so that we can carry them through into our second milestone, which is identifying a recommended alternative, effectively about 10% engineering and design on that particular concept, we're looking about uh, spring of next year to come to a recommended alternative. At that point, uh, a, a good chunk of next year, we're going to be taking that recommended alternative and actually putting it through that, that NEPA or that National Environmental Policy Act procedures and policies uh, complying with federal law to determine our locally preferred alternative, which would be about this time next year. Uh, from there, we're going to take that project concept, put it through 30% design, leaving us at about spring of 2021. Uh, ultimately, like I mentioned before, with the goal of having a, an application to FTA to approve funding to move the project into final design and construction. Now, we have a three-year contract. 
We're looking to get the effort done in about 28 months, um, and that allows for uh, plenty of time for a public conversation. Um, however, if there are points along the way where we need to slow down and make sure that we have a robust community and public outreach uh, a dialogue, we can most certainly do that, and we have the opportunity for do that in our schedule. So as we stand here today, your team has been working very hard. T. Bart has been working, and staff has been working very hard. We've had uh, uh, two executive team meetings, which includes FDOT and the three transit agencies that are part of this project. Uh, we've had a kickoff with a business working group, which includes business partners as well as chambers across the region. We've also had our kickoff with a, what we're calling our station working group, which includes the MPOs as well as land use uh, agency uh, staff from the three county area. And they're gonna really be helping us with that station conversation, where it is, what do they look like, how does it fit into the community. We're doing a lot of data collection, including we've completed a full drone survey of the corridor. Uh, we've begun evaluating those stations and having that dialogue. Like I said, we had that kickoff with that station working group starting that conversation about the 21 stations, do we need all 21? Is it something less um, and where are they? We're also developing our public involvement plan, our project management plans, and we've initiated our purpose and need effort and identifying a purpose and need for the purposes of NEPA. Today I'd like to talk to you, I mentioned the introduction, we're gonna talk a little bit about goals. October, we'd like to come back to the board and, and provide an update on some of the feedback we're getting in regards to the station areas. And then ultimately in November, as we start to wind down that first milestone, talk about how do we make some of those connections between those individual station areas. So we've been working very closely with Mr. Jaddick, the T-Barta Communications Director. We're anticipating effectively a soft launch on the public outreach uh, September 1st. Uh, that'll include a project-specific website, which you see here, uh, which is branded to match exactly with T. Barta's overall website update, so the user will um, have a very seamless experience between both the project website and the general T. Barta website. Lots of opportunities for people to sign up and get involved in the project as a whole. Um, and one of the things that we're doing is, um, uh, as part of our tools of public outreach, is developing videos that we can easily share with our partners, uh, whether it's an agency committee or a particular neighborhood association, to give updates on the project and to hopefully get folks excited and, and get the awareness out there about the project so people can get involved, sign up, and provide and participate. I do have our first video, which will be part of that soft launch uh, that we're looking at um, in the uh, September 1st timeline. See if I can get that to play. I will have that for you in a moment. It worked well in the first. It did. It worked very well right from this machine. Too. Uh, so actually, while I fix that, I'll definitely give you an opportunity to look at the video. Um, when we move to, um, you know, moving the project forward. Uh, like I mentioned, we want to uh, have and establish the goals for this process. And the, the, what we're doing and what we're focusing on is building upon the success that we had during the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. So we had a purpose for the RTFP, which was identifying you know, those regional options and that regional service. And if you remember back some of those goals for identifying that project that gave us the corridor, that gave us the mode, was a project or a goal that serves the region, was top performing, and the first of many. Well, we accomplished those goals in establishing that catalyst that we're moving into the project development process. But as we get into this greater level of detail, what we're doing is specifically digging into that first goal, <coughs> serves the region. Well, what exactly does that mean? So as we go through the engineering phase and we start looking at the environmental work, it's really important for us to really understand exactly what our objectives are in relation to serving the region. So with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Mr. Uretovac from AECON. Um, Don is a, a, a nationally recognized BRT expert and I'll actually have him uh, give you a little bit of his background and his history and he's gonna talk about some of those goals as we move forward. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Well, as Scott mentioned, my name is Don Uradovac, and I'm with AECOM. We're serving as a subcontractor for WSP. 
A little bit of my background, I joined um, AECOM following a third year career with the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, where I had the honor of being um, a project manager for the Healthline BRT uh, there, which has been recognized by the Institute for Transportation Development and Policy as the best BRT in North America. Uh, why? Not only because of the physical characteristics associated with the um, Healthline, but also how it performed. Uh, just in a nutshell, experienced a 68% increase in ridership, 35% uh, reduction in travel time along the corridor, over $10 billion of new economic development along the line, and a 95% uh, customer satisfaction rating. So I'm very proud of that. And that was, as Scott said, you know, it's transformative. And that was the first of what is now three BRT lines in Cleveland. And, you know, and I, I've been working on BRT in New York, started with their first line. They're now up to about 10 or 12 and still growing. So this won't be a one-shot deal with the I-75 uh, St. Petersburg to Wesley Chapel because once it's implemented, once it's operational, residents see the uh, benefits of it, you're going to be getting requests for other communities in your region as well through that system. So with that, one of the first tasks is, is uh, in addition to the public involvement, is we have to formulate what we call a purpose and need statement, which is a Federal Transit Administration requirement, which is a document that says, why the heck are you doing this project? What do you hope to achieve? Well, uh, what we hope to achieve, and I'll go root through a number of potential goals and objectives, which we've been working with TBAR to staff and uh, project executive committee. But throughout the course of the project, you're going to be called on to make countless number of decisions. They all have to be defensible. And you're not only going to get double guessed on these decisions, you're going to get triple and quadruple guessed on them. So it's important that we be able to have defensible positions that we could relate back to a set of goals and objectives. It said we did this because it complies with this goal with respect to economic development or with increasing ridership or improving operations in the quarter. So just briefly, you know, some of the um, draft goals which we're starting to um, uh, articulate and discuss among the different stakeholders is uh, mobility for residents. Uh, what does that mean? It means we want to increase transit ridership, provide more balanced modal choices, and particularly choices for elderly and transit dependent and minorities so that they can reach jobs, housing, and other trips. Another important one is premium transit service. One of the things we often do when we take the video out to uh, the public, people respond, well, that's not like what I envisioned a bus system to be. I wouldn't ride a bus, I would ride that. So it's not your grandfather or your grandmother's uh, bus system. It's uh, got up, upscale passenger amenities and experience, uh, and like I said, improved travel time and reliability, and also importantly, helps improve the uh, image of TBARDA as a progressive dynamic organization uh, within the community. You know, as, as being development director for the former Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, once they saw the advantages of working closely with us and bringing transit into the project and funding, you know, developers, we would often become their first or second stop in the development process to see what we could do to enhance their development, uh, make it more successful, while possibly reducing their costs. The uh, Healthline BRT, a good portion of that was spent on improving the public infrastructure. Why is that important? Because now the developer wants to redevelop a building. We've done the uh, streetscape landscaping from his front door out to the other side of the boulevard. Why is that important? It saves him the money on improving the sidewalks, putting in the landscaping, making it a more uh, impressive and uh, pleasing entrance way to his development, which thereby decreases his cost on the overall project, which improves the economics of it immensely. Uh, another important consideration is improving access to jobs. Uh, access ex accessibility to not only existing, but planned development opportunities as well. Uh, 
we need to look forward to not only what's there today, but what's coming. Uh, I was amazed at how some of the areas are exploding with new development or, or along the quarter. So we have to be sure, Scott's team has to be sure, that it's designed in a manner which can accommodate those future development opportunities. Uh, development of an operating plan to serve uh, the needs of the public. As a um, young lady here said, you know, what buses serve it? You know, local buses, express buses, BRT buses. You want to maximize the number of buses you put in your public investment. Uh, that only makes sense, number one, from an investment standpoint. Two, because it saves the operator money by increasing his speed and reliability one quarter. Uh, and also to serve areas um, for affordable workforce housing. It's always a big issue, especially in communities such as this, where you have a lot of uh, service industry workers to support your tourism. Uh, one of the big problems is having affordable housing or access to affordable housing in close proximity or reasonable proximity to their jobs. So we'll be looking at that as well. Context-sensitive community stations. Uh, you don't want to put an ultra-modern station into a uh, historic community. Number one, residents aren't going to want it. Two, uh, FDA won't approve it. Three, your state historic preservation society will throw you out the door. So we have to work with the community to develop a consistent identity for the system, but yet modify the station so that they blend in with the surrounding communities and help support what the local communities and neighborhoods are trying to achieve in terms of their, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of their identity and their plans for the area. Uh, by improving that, having the identity, being consistent with the plans for the area is another means of fostering improved economic development. Lastly, we also want to de design our infrastructure improvements. How do you do a road improvement or a bridge or access to these stations that complements and supports what the community is trying to do with their bike paths and pedestrian paths, jogging paths, whatever else uh, they're doing in terms of transportation infrastructure in their community to help improvement? One of the nice things that FTA has recognized is Eligible funding is not for the immediate, not only for the immediate transit improvement. It's access to and from the improvement as well, sometimes up to a quarter of a mile. So we could build a nice, you know, get it, building a nice station is fabulous if you can get to it. So we build an accessible one, not only accessible for those with disabilities, but those that may want to make it safe and convenient to use, lighted pathways, uh, trailblazing graphics, whatever has it, have you. Seamless transit was another thing that was identified. What does that mean? It means the ability to transfer easily between modes, be it a park and ride lot, be it a feeder bus service, be it parking your bike. You, know, you don't want to have to drive your bike uh, to a station, park it you know, a mile away at a bike rack. It's got to be in close proximity so you can make that transfer as easily and seamlessly as possible. Supporting local transit, there's going to be a number of different operators, and that's still to be determined who's actually going to be running the BRT, who's going to be using it. But we need to make sure that we accommodate everyone's needs so that HART and, and PSTA and all the other users, potential users of it, can use it in a consistent manner and that it accommodates their needs. Uh, one of the things we may be looking at is elevated platforms, so people just walk on and off uh, the bus seamlessly. But, you know, if someone's got a low platform bus, someone's got a higher platform bus, they're not going to work. So we need to work with the local transit operators to make that transition as easy as possible. Uh, one of the mistakes we made in Cleveland, and, you know, in hindsight it turned out to be a mistake, uh, when we're building the system, we went to all the vehicle manufacturers and we said, what's the, um, what's the standard floor height? Well, 15 inches. So we built our platforms up at 15 inch height. You know, several years later, the industry changed it to 14 inch platforms. 
So now when we have to replace those buses, we either have to elevate the roadway, make it more uh, cross, you know, a level, or else reduce the um, uh, surface of the platform. Uh, one of the lessons learned then is now we don't design them at 15 inch, what the current uh, industry calls for. We're designing them at 13 inches. So there may be a little bit of gap now, but it certainly is, beats the heck out of having to raise the roadway or lower the platform. Uh, we want to support our local, local partners. Uh, who might they be? They may be your job access programs, a uh, number of different community groups uh, rely on, you know, getting a job is the ultimate goal, and transportation is a critical link in that chain getting the potential user from his home to that employment opportunity. Economic development. As I mentioned, uh, Cleveland is an excellent example. Uh, we do have a high platform rapid transit system, which was built in 1954, and it was located in a railroad right-of-way. Why? Because it was easy and cheap to build. The consequence of that is that the development along railroad right-of-way that happened in 1954 is still evident there today in almost 2020. So it hasn't had the great economic development impact because the development uh, trends were already set. Here we're doing it a little differently with our bus rapid transit system. We're working with the community, with the Cleveland Clinic. You, you, you know, have, employ 35,000 people. Why don't we take the entrance from the clinic from Prospect Avenue, which is at the back side of the quarter, and move, make it the front door to the health line? They've done that. We've uh, we put in a few extra dollars to make that transition easier. That's one of the biggest users, not only for employees or visitors, but people want, they're at the hospital, you want to hop on a quick, reliable ride to go down several miles to a restaurant, do their banking, whatever it is, uh, while they're waiting for their appointment, or waiting for their um, person that they're there for. The, also, what happened with the health line is uh, there were three different uh, developmental uses. One was institutional, one was residential, and one was commercial. We had to design a system that accommodated all of those, uh, and that was one of the keys. The system in the residential area looks and works different than the system in the in, uh, institutional area and also in the commercial area. And I said there was, a, there was a need, and it was expressed earlier uh, by, by one of the committee members, about the need for all-day commuter service. Uh, that's very important, again, particularly in an area of this, a lot of tourists. Uh, and the all-day commuter, which could be for medical, could be for educational, uh, could be for shopping, that works also well for the visitor market. You know, people who want to go from the beaches out to maybe some shopping malls. So that's another important critical element, why the service will be operating all day as opposed to the express bus service made to stop rate in the rush hour time period. And then lastly, one of the key things is the quick, reliable, and frequent service, which everyone mentioned. Uh, again, in Cleveland, the, um, we're able to reduce the travel time by 35%, uh, which is significant. And uh, another thing, particularly in this quarter, as I saw riding it the other day, the uh, bottlenecks at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, by having our own exclusive lane and prioritization treatment for traffic flow, we're able to improve the reliability. So things like working mother, which has to pick up their uh, child from daycare, no later than 6 o'clock, she can now be assured that she's going to be there by 6 o'clock uh, to make that trip. So uh, we'll be refining these goals even further further as we go along and interact with the Citizens Advisory Committee and Chief Art staff and all of you and look forward to that opportunity. Thank you, Don. Um, and as Don mentioned, the next steps here <coughs> is taking these uh, draft goals, 
um, and working them through the individual committees and then bringing them back to you at that October board meeting for some additional conversation. But at this point, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, if, uh, if, if interested, we can certainly open to questions. Uh, and really, we're just making sure we're heading in the right direction. And have we missed anything that needs to be? Are we uh, not going to be able to see the video today, or is there a technical? I will be that? able to play that if you would like to see it now. I can do it now, or we can wait until after conference. How long is it? It's less than two minutes. Say again. Less than two I would, minutes. I would recommend we see it now and then have questions because there might be some questions regarding the video. primary goal for this installment of the video is to get people interested, keep people engaged in the project, and drive them to our website. But as we go through the process and we get some more decisions made and get some more details as to the actual uh, composition and makeup of the project, we're going to add modules to this and you know keep using this as a tool for our public outreach. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll take it. I think that's an excellent, in my opinion, a very excellent movie and presentation okay. there. And Hopefully, we can potentially refine that and get that plane in loops around the Tampa Bay area, maybe at the airport as you come in, St. Petersburg, you know, places of interest in the in museums and so forth, because it gets the buzz going. So I, I think it's a great first step. Uh, okay. Members' questions? Commissioner. Thank you. Um, when you were speaking, you only referred to one BRT system, which is a true gold BRT system, well, the best in the country in terms of being recognized as such, um, the Health Line in Cleveland. Uh, but the Health Line in Cleveland is through downtown at arterial level, correct? Okay. So, and then two of the pictures up there that you showed on the video, too, are arterial level BRTs. When you first put this presentation together, you did have um, the kind of whatever, I mean, it, you Keep, it keeps being called BRT no matter what. But, um, um, and you know, I, even the first thing I looked up when I looked up the Denver Flatiron Flyer was a critique about the fact that it wasn't BRT um, and, and hasn't been considered that. But, um, but and, and I think express buses are fine and that we should just start them now and, you know, just start doing it uh, if this is the desire. Um, but um, I just, do you see any distinction? I, I do you not distinguish between arterial level BRT and on the expressway, uh, whatever system you're calling this, um, in terms of, I mean, to me, it's like comparing apples and oranges. But are you maintaining kind of like whatever uh, the health line, it, it would be similar to this? There's, there's three different. 
One, which is the Cleveland one, which is a replacement BRC. In other words, there were local services running on the arterial that was replaced by a BRC. In New York City, we do a lot of what we call overlay, where they maintain the local service and we put the BRC on top of it. Third one is new, which will be this one. It'll be like our uh, US 36 uh, BRT. So they, they're different in where they run. They pretty much operate the same. What we try to do is make it look like a rail experience where you have a dedicated station. You pay your fare before you get on the bus. There's uh, real-time transit information. And all the other amenities you associate with the train station. Uh, so in that regard, whether it's running in the middle of the road, on the side of the that's all the same. The stop distances tend to get longer on the freeways, uh, which is fine because you know, when you start putting them on the freeway, now you've got an access to the station. Uh, so now we want to space them out further and have people parking right lots is a good example. So they can come, you can uh, space the stations further. Or if you've got neighborhoods along the way, development operations. So the operating concept is pretty much the same. Physical environment obviously is much different. I mean, well, basically, in summary, you know, the <laughs> principles stay the same. Bus rapid transit. And the way you make that bus rapid is by investing in the infrastructure to allow it to be rapid. So there are dis distinguishes. There are differences between uh, something that's uh, operating at street level versus the highway, um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the principles are the same. Investing in the infrastructure to make sure that that service is quick and reliable. I think it would be, it would be valuable for me and the community to have more um, explicit uh, comparisons, like the express bus in Miami today, which I thought was not really didn't have the depth that I would appreciate in terms of. Um, understanding how it operates and how it would be valuable um, to this community. Um, when I look at the Denver Flatiron Flyer, which we didn't get any information about, even though it was pictured up here, I mean, they said in 2016, before they started the service, it was an express bus service and it was getting 14,000 people a day. Um, and then they said that they really didn't do much but add up, you know, put nicer buses on it. They didn't do onboarding. Um, that's some of the critique. Um, there's some other, but you know, to not have some apple to apple and education about this and an understanding about what the um, the multimodal centers that are referred to, which are actually parking garages by all accounts, I just think it is not. Um, it doesn't give us a valuable idea of what is in the works here or what its possibilities are. Well, Commissioner, we can certainly do that, and obviously, as we continue to vet out the purpose and goals for this project, we're going to have to have that conversation. So, um, as we've discussed, we can bring some of that information back to you. Thank you. Members, other questions? Uh, none being heard. Thanks so much for that presentation. Look forward to continuing to work with you.